Welcome back to the Barry Lawrence Ruderman Conference on Cartography, Indigenous Mapping. We are now about to begin panel one, Digital Approaches one. After our amazing keynote lecture, um, I have a lot of questions and I'm sure that you all do. And I am very excited to introduce our speakers for the next panel. My name is Anna Pulido Rule. I am an associate professor of colonial art at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Um, the topic of this conference is very um, essential to me because I also study indigenous cartography. I work on a group of maps from New Spain or colonial Mexico created by indigenous artists uh, for legal disputes over land under boundaries. So this has all been very exciting and interesting to me. I will now introduce the three speakers uh, now in the beginning, and then after the panel, we will have our Q&A. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then at the end of the panel, I will read them out in the order in which they were received. Our first speaker is Takere Norton. He is the manager of Nagai Tahu Archive Team. Takere worked as an environmental advisor for Ngai Tahu for nearly 10 years, protecting sites of cultural significance. Since 2007, he has headed Kahuru Manu, recording traditional Ngai Tahu knowledge on the Tribal Geographical Information System, or GIS. Takare was also co editor of the Tangata Nagai Tahu, People of Nagai Tahu, published in 2017 that was long listed for the 2018 Okham New Zealand Book Awards and was part of the archive team that produced Kareao, the online Nagai Tahu digital archive. I will copy the link on our chat. He will present a paper entitled Kahuru Manu, My Names Are the Treasured Cloak Which Adorns the Lab. Our second speaker in this panel is Rudo Kemper. He is a human geographer with a background in archives and digital storytelling and a lifelong technology thinker. For the past decade, he has worked in solidarity with indigenous and Afro-descendant communities in the Amazon to map their ancestral lands and document their traditional knowledge and oral histories. He is passionate about co-creating and applying technology to support marginalized communities in defending their right to self-determination and representation, and being in control of telling their own stories. Rudo currently works with Digital Democracy, where he is accompanying local communities across the globe in defending their lands, and stewarding the development of the Earth Defenders Toolkit, a new collaborative space for Earth Defender communities and their allies. He also serves on the executive boards of Native Land Digital and the International Society for Participatory Map. And is one of the core stewards of the open source geo storytelling application known as Terra Stories. Rudo is originally from Curaçao, but is currently based in Springfield, Virginia. He's going to present a paper titled on autonomy in digital approaches to participatory, sorry, to participatory indigenous map. And finally, our last panelist will be Tanya Wolfgram. Tanya Wolfgram is the executive director of the Great Pacific. Her father, Tevita Wolfgram, is of Ha'a, Lavaki, Tapueluelu, descendants of Ulukalala, Tui, Baba'u, of the Kingdom of Tonga. I hope I got the pronunciation right. Her mother is Huacatohia and Ti Aupuori of the tribes of Aotearoa, New Zealand. A cultural psychologist, systems designer, strategist, technologist, voyager, and storyteller, Tanya is the founder of Hakamana, system of transformative design, which has been applied across health, education, creative, and technology sectors in many countries. Tanya is also the founder of Grid Pacific, who aims to support the vision and heritage of Pacific nations while helping them to showcase the beauty and charisma of their cultures, landscapes, oceans, and people to the world with amazing mapping and VR technologies. Working with Google Maps and Street View, she has been recording panoramic high-res 3D imagery in Aotearoa, Tonga, Rarotonga, and Rapa Nui in recent years that have been processed and published globally. She has also developed 10 Pacific language layers that are mapped into Google Earth Indigenous Languages layers. 
An advocate of indigenous technological sovereignty, Tanya seeks to embed and imbue Pacific values of aroha, love, pono, goodness, and rahi, mari, peace, into Great Pacific's traditional and technological experiences. Her paper is called Te Hamoana, Mapping Ocean Voices. So now uh, we will, I will pass it on to our first speaker, Takere Norton. Uh, Takere, if you want to take it on from here. Uh, kia ora tato, me to te tine te miki koutou, i hui hui mai nei. Uh, kia ora everyone, my name's uh, Takere Norton. Uh, I work for my Māori tribe, iwi, uh, called Naitahu, which is based in the South Island of New Zealand. And this morning, this morning for me, <laughs> I will be presenting uh, Kahuru Manu, which is our Naitahu cultural mapping project. Uh, I also want to say apologies for the lighting at 6am here in New Zealand, and I can't use the, the lights up there. So uh, the main thing you can see the screen and not worry about me too much. Uh, this this talk this morning is really about how a, how, an, how an Indigenous community comes together to tell our story, because for so long, Naitahu has never been in a position to tell our story um, for, for so many reasons. And the last 30 years has seen a huge growth uh, in our people being able to tell our stories through um, digital initi initi uh, initiatives um, and published books as well. So really, I want to talk about how we have worked together to produce this digital atlas of Naito history, which is publicly available to anyone. Um, that, but before I do, I really want to talk a bit about who Naito is for some background. Uh, we'll then talk about sort of the journey to building this mapping project. Uh, we will have a look at the atlas itself. Uh, then I would like to talk about uh, one of the maps we've used to bring our Naitahu history to life. And then I want to finish off by showing you that this mapping project is part of a, a much wider effort by our tribal communities um, to make our knowledge available firstly to our own people, uh, but also to the wider community as well. And we want to ensure that our stories are told correctly uh, throughout New Zealand, uh, and in particular, I guess, through uh, the local and national educational um, scene as well. This image you have up here, uh, this is quite a pivotal moment in our cultural mapping story. This was uh, a gathering of tribal members uh, and experts in 2012. Uh, this is at one of our traditional meeting houses uh, on the east coast of the South Island. And it was at this very um, meeting where our people said they wanted to create a, a digital atlas. And so since this, this meeting in 2012, the work of our archive team has been to build a digital atlas uh, for our people. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on. Quick about myself. Uh, so I'm Naitahu descent uh, through, my, through my father um, and I'm European descent of my, of my mother as well. So, okay, next slide. So just briefly, a bit of background about Naitahu. Uh, there's 72,000 uh, members within our, within our tribe. This map you see here in front of you, um, everything below that, that V line, everything in that dark blue, that is uh, the tribal area of Naitahu. So we cover uh, about 80% uh, of the South Island. Uh, we easily have the largest... Uh, land mass of any um, iwi in New Zealand. And I guess we're probably about the fifth or sixth largest tribe in terms of um, population. And to be Naitahu, you must be a blood descendant of a Naitahu person alive in 1848, which was when a, a major census was uh, undertaken. Uh, this image here, this person on the left, his name is Matiaha Teromorehu, one of our leading uh, chiefs in the 1800s. In 1849, he wrote the very first petition seeking justice against uh, the British Crown um, for breaking their promises when purchasing the lands um, off Naitahu between 1840 and 1860. This image on the right is of Naitahu people uh, in the New Zealand Parliament witnessing 
the passing of the Ngaitahu Claims Settlement Act, which was, I guess, a settlement between Ngaitahu and the Crown um, to acknowledge the breaches that the Crown had made when purchasing um, our traditional lands. And as part of that settlement, uh, there were um, legal initiatives ar around cultural redress and economic redress as well. But the point I want to quickly make is that for since the Naito lands were purchased in the 1840s, 50s and 60s, we've really been, um, we've had very little resource and we've had seven generations who have fought for justice uh, against these broken promises. And the, the 1990s, um, Naito, for the first time through the settlement, um, had the resources to really control our future. We for so long, we had been fighting the Crown to receive justice. So the last 20, 30 years um, has been a real area of growth for the tribe. Okay, let's go on to the mapping project itself. So this is this meeting I talked about at the very start. In 2012, our people came together and they wanted, they explained how they wanted to create a digital Naito atlas, firstly for our own people uh, and for others uh, in the wider community as well. And these two gentlemen here at the front, um, they were absolutely critical uh, in making this project uh, come alive and uh, were heavily involved in the negotiations uh, for the NITO settlement, which occurred in the 1990s. Okay, so when we had this, uh, I guess, uh, directive to board this atlas, uh, we started having these, these meetings uh, mapping uh, our sites of cultural significance. And when we started, uh, we would have meetings like this where I would purchase these large uh, 150,000 typographic maps of our tribal areas and we would sit down and map place names and sites on the maps and people would bring along their information and anything we found in external archives and libraries we would bring as well. Uh, and, and again, this is Trevor House who was um, one of the elders who really led and championed this project and really and came to sort of every meeting that we had. And it was quite a slow process because what we would do, we would see a name, we would literally print it out on a label machine, we'd put it on the map, put it next to a sticker, realize, oh, we could have spelled that name wrong, print it again, take that sticker off, put the new sticker on. So, you know, we could only map very slowly, but but what it did, it allowed us to build these really good relationships with our, with our communities um, and people really enjoyed it. And um, we thought that, well, if we're gonna go down this path of using this sort of, this sort of um, sticker label type process, we'll, we'll be, take us another seven generations um, to create this digital atlas. So we then worked with our GIS team and we created, a NITO who place names database in Microsoft um, CRM. And we that was linked to our NITO who internal GIS system. What that enabled us to do was travel around um, our island, meet with our people on their traditional in their traditional meeting houses and in, in their marae, and we could map directly into the database and you could see the changes being made right in front of you. And our people absolutely loved it. Over probably seven to eight years, you know, we would have had close to probably 150, 200 meetings. And these meetings would go for two or three days and they'd be on the weekends, we'd work days, we'd work nights, and people would come along with material from under their beds or stuff they've held on from their parents and grandparents and we would mix it with the stuff that we would have and we would just sit there for two three days just mapping into the database and you could see it all happen there and we would have people turn up who were uh, our elders retired people you know local fishermen who knew exactly where the fishing markers were and those sorts of things so it was a real combination of i guess our little archive research team of three or four people and um, our communities out in the regions, you know, who were all volunteers, you know, who turned up in their own time wanting to contribute um, to this project. But the amount of bill, amount of trust and goodwill, 
goodwill it built within our communities um, really laid the foundation uh, for our mapping project. One of the most exciting things we had is that we challenged ourselves to go and visit every one of our sites. <laughs> so um, we would have these amazing field trips that would go for three to four or five days, you know, all throughout the South Island, um, visiting our places. And we would bring archaeologists with us, we would have our elders, we would bring guest speakers. Um, you know, you can see there would jump in jet boats and four-wheel drives and just trying to find all these places and sort of... Um, it would help us get more accurate data in terms of location of sites. But again, it was just a fantastic opportunity um, to share knowledge and to share stories. And, you know, sometimes um, parents would bring their children um, out of school to come with us as well. So, um, again, this sort of was really heartwarming stuff. Um, and our people just really loved it and really bought into what we we're doing. So after about again, six, seven, eight years of, of having these mapping field trips and having these meetings, mapping sites, um, we, we produced, <laughs> this is the outcome of that work. Um, we've mapped about 6,000 traditional Māori place names uh, within uh, our tribal region, and this is it here. Um, and if I was to zoom in, you would see uh, more and more sites pop up. Um, but this is 6,000 multi place names. They are of mountains, of rivers, of streams, of lakes, traditional food gathering sites, settlements, um, cemeteries, uh, harbors, bays, just a host um, of different of a variety of values. And so you can imagine the um, effort it took in terms of traveling around and trying to visit um, all these sites. But, um, but this is sort of the outcome of what we've done. And I, what I do wanna say is that, although this looks impressive, there's still much more work to do. There's so many more information sources we haven't even touched on yet. But what we do have is an amazing foundation um, for our future generations to work from because um, this project is a is really ongoing and it's a living uh, project that will hopefully ha, never stop and that sort of thing but it is a great foundation for, for our future future generations to work from the other thing i want to mention as well is that uh, every name must be referenced okay so every name must be referenced and usually it's just coming from um, a map produced in the 1800s or um, a host of material gathered by European um, historians, newspaper articles, uh, tribal manuscripts that, that families um, have held on to, uh, a variety of, of information sources. But everything must be mapped um, um, with validated references that are approved by the local community. And a lot of this information we have used uh, in environment court hearings um, and, in, and in sort of legislative processes uh, to protect our cultural site. So it's really important that when we stand up in court and we present this evidence hand on heart, we know it is as, as good as it is and we can defend anything that comes our, our way. Okay, so this is just uh, a little snapshot of what sits behind one of those place names here. Um, and I've got the example here of um, Otamatako, which is a which is a traditional Māori place name for river that is um, that is known as the Otamatata. And I don't know whether that's a Māori name or not, but Otamatako is the traditional Māori name for that river. And every name has a little narrative. And that narrative could be a sentence or it could be uh, 200 words. It might talk about what the name means, the food scattered there, the people that live there, or any other stories. But it's a small narrative that the local community is happy uh, to be public. And under the reference summary, these are all the references for that place name. Okay, so you can see here, 
um, te hurahuru, te whare kōrari, rauri tamamaru, tiki pukuraku. These are four or five Naitahu people in the 1800s who have said that this is the correct name, all independent of each other. And that's really important because one of the big issues we have, especially in the South Island, is that when we've had um, these amazing European collectors of, Mo of Naito history and place names, in their published material, they don't always identify who their Naito informant is. So a big part for us is when we're doing this research, we want to know who is the Naito person that gave that place name. And we want to make sure that they get the same recognition as the European collector of that place name as well. And for this place name, or Tamatako, this is a notebook produced in 1915 by one of our people, Tiki Pukarako, and this is uh, or Tamatako highlighted in yellow here. So what's important for us is to be able to see the name, read the narrative, and go to the historic document. And this image here, this is of the five people um, who gave that name or who recorded that name as or Tamatako for that river. So identifying the Naitahu informants is a huge part of our work and we want our people to know um, these are your ancestors who gave uh, these place names because um, in a large majority of the, of the situation, they had actually not been um, sort of publicly identified and given the sort of mana that they deserve. Okay, the other values we've mapped um, are the traditional travel routes our people use to travel throughout the South Island. So these green lines you can see in front of you, um, these are the traditional travel routes. Uh, essentially, the coastline along the East Coast and the West Coast are, are the main travel routes, and every river is, is a travel route into the high country, into the Southern Alps, into the interior of the island. And some rivers get used more than others. Once you reach the interior, the mountainous terrain of the Southern Alps, there are really only four or five passes how people use to travel through the mountains. So um, this is probably the, the best map there is of traditional travel routes we have uh, in the South Island. And this here, this map, these are the, these are the Māori reserves, the original Māori reserves allocated to our people when the Crown purchased our traditional lands in the 1850s, okay? So remember that map at the start? There was that V-line shape up here. You know, you can see how tiny these reserves are. Uh, when our people sold our lands, the expectation was that one-tenth of the land sold would be reserved for our people. And as you can see in this map, you know, these reserves are completely, uh, not even close to one-tenth. And, and these are the locations of our traditional communities today. So Māori place names, the traditional Māori travel routes, and the original Māori reserves are the three values that we've mapped for our mapping project. So we've done all this amazing work with our people. They actually love it. They've bought into it. And they want to make it accessible. Um, so we built a website. This is a public website, uh, kahurumanu.co.nz. You can go on this at any time. Uh, this is the, the front page of that there, the landing page. Um, we launched it at our tribal AGM in 2017. Um, and it, there's a whole, there's just such a great range of material here, ranging from biographies of those tribal elders who brought this project to life. There's a whole lot of maps, there's images, um, there's history of Naitahu, um, and, we, and there's all these amazing interactive tools that you can jump on and use. But the real great part of the, of the website is the digital atlas, which you can see here. So out of those six and a half thousand multi place names we've met, only about 1,500 are available on the public website. And that's purely because there's just so much work involved in researching, writing narratives for all these place names. But we, because this is on our own system and this is our own project, we can add as many place names uh, as we want to as we go on. And so the idea is that every couple of years, we'll just add on more and more place names that the regional communities are happy with. 
it's quite simple to use. You can just zoom in like any other sort of digital map or in this text search box up here, you can type in the Māori place name, the European place name or a street address and it will take you uh, to that area. And this is the example I showed before. This is Otamataco. Um, and you can see here, uh, here's the name. Uh, you can see the narrative on the on the sidebar, and these are all the references uh, for that name in that. So 1,500 uh, stories available on the public website. I'm going to quickly talk about one of our maps. So just to show you the depth that we have here um, behind each name. Uh, this is the person on the left, Thomas Broderick. He's an uh, early surveyor, okay? And he got, um, there is a request from him from the, from the survey general to go to the local Māori village to record Māori place names in the South Canterbury region, which is about two hours north of where I am in Christchurch. Um, he went to the local village. Uh, he tried to find the people to talk to about the local Māori place names. They're all away gathering foods. He then gets told, travel south for three hours to another Māori village and meet a man, Rauli Tamaiti. This is the man here. He travelled by train. He met with Tamaiti, who was one of our great historians, for a better word. Um, this occurs sort of in, 18, in the 1890s. Tamaiti is about 100 years of age. He's very ill. His son um, is the translator, talking between them. Um, and Tamaiti uh, warms up to Broderick. And eventually, Tamaiti tells him uh, over 200 Māori place names in the South Island. And Broderick records the place names on this map, which is of Lake Hawe and Wanaka uh, in the centre of the South Island. Um, this is the most detailed map of Māori place names um, in the central Otago region. And Broderick says that Tamaiti's descriptions were so detailed, he knew exactly where the places were. So Broderick records these names on this map from the information that Tamaiti tells him in about 1898, 90, uh, I want to show you this area here. This is a little lagoon called Manu Haia. Um, and it got sort of washed out. Uh, when the lake was raised in the 1950s for hydroelectricity development. It was one of our uh, famous sites for uh, gathering eels, but it's also a really important place um, that the people used as a sort of traditional whariwananga, passing on uh, stories and that sort of thing here. And here is this amazing image of the old lagoon which is no longer here. And so the settlement was beside the, beside the lagoon and our people would come up here. Uh, they would um, gather huge amounts of, of eels and birds and then take them back to their communities um, on, the, on the coastline here. Uh, this lagoon is no longer there anymore. And as, as I said before, it got washed out um, when the lake was risen in the 1950s. I just want to quickly show how this worked are uh, linked to our wider work of our archive team in building this, I call it the Naitahu Google. So this is our public online archive database called Kariao. There are 6,000 of items on here. Again, this is a public website that anyone can use at any time. Uh, again, here's a search box. If I typed in Rauri Tamari, the name of that person who provided those place names, a biography would come up. Okay, so there's a biography of Tamari on the website, and this is his map. This is the map that I showed you just before. All the maps and all the books that we've used to bring Kahuru Money to life are now available on um, our public website for our people to access them. And next year, what will happen is that when you click on Money Higher, so this is where the lagoon was, okay? Uh, and the lake has now risen over the lagoon. This orange area here, that is a fisheries easement that was allocated by the Crown for our people to use to gather eels. The, on the sidebar, you see the narrative, you see the references. Next year, when you click on the Rauri Tamari map, it will take you to the map in Kariao. So, so you can see we are building this Naito Google search engine where place names, maps, biographies are available for our people um, at their fingertips. 
one of the final things I want to mention as well, and probably one of our biggest achievements, is that a couple of years ago, the New Zealand Geographic Board, the National Naming Authority here in New Zealand, um, they made a decision to accept Kahuru Manu as an authoritative publication um, based on the amount uh, of research and the thoroughness of our work with our communities, which means if place names, the place names on Kahuru Manu will be transferred into the New Zealand Gazetteer. If we have a Māori place name and there is no Pākehā equivalent name, uh, our name can be fast-tracked to an official status, which is an amazing effort. Um, you know, between 1998 and, say, 2017, you know, we probably only made 20 names, Māori names, official in our tribal area. Since Kahuru Money was published, something like 200 names have been made official. So having that status allows us to put our place names into the gazetteer and so they can become official. So as you can see here, that place Manu Haia, um, this is Manu Haia here, it is now an official place name. And so that means our names and our histories and our stories are recorded in the gazetteer and we become, um, our people become, I guess, the, the acknowledged informant of our, of our histories. And if you click, on Manu Haia in the Gazetteer and you click on its history, it takes you back to Kahuru Manu. And so we become the authority on our own place names. Uh, just quickly, I just want to show you some of the other benefits our mapping project has had. Um, this is the opening of a school um, in Central Otago and they've named it Te Kura or Taki Karara. They have named it after one of our historic past sites in central Otago. And this never would have happened 20, 30 years ago. And that name, Taki Karara, is now an official place name. So that name, Taki Karara, is embedded now in the local community, Māori and non-Māori. This is a visitor centre that is looking up to our, our ancestral mountain, Aoraki Mount Cook. And in this centre, we have put all of our stories and place names gathered from our mapping project. Um, and the name is Punatahu. And again, that is a traditional name. We've mapped on Kahuru Manu and our people have used it for the visitor centre. So again, these names are not just entrenched in the official gazetteer, but also being used by our communities in real life. Uh, this is part of our Naito Google. We uh, are publishing books on Naito biographies. Um, Tangata Naita, who won, came out four years ago. Our second volume comes out next year. But what it includes is 50 biographies in each book about Naita people. And what is fantastic is that these people you see in front of you here, these are identified Naita informants that we've used for our mapping project. They all have a 1,000 word biography about them. Some of them are well known and some of them aren't. But what we are doing is that all these biographies are linked to our place names. So we are using place names, I guess, as uh, uh, entrance into learning more about Naito history. And the final slide, I just want to say that for me, the success of this project is because we've done it ourselves. We have had no government involvement, no government department has been involved in any of the work I've talked about today. It has been owned by us, and I think that's why our people have absolutely loved it, because it's for Naitahu, by Naitahu, and they have seen um, that challenge they set us up in 2012 at this meeting has come to fruition, and it's probably gone further than any of our expectations. So I should probably finish there. I've probably spoken for too long, but uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity um, of being here this morning. Um, Kahuru Manu and Kariao are public websites, so you can feel free to jump on them uh, at any time. Uh, Tēnā te mihi, uh, ki tato. Thank you very much, Tagray, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I was fascinated, and I can see from the Q&A, from, from the comments in the chat, that 
that kind of work that you have done over the years, this digital Atlas, Naitahu Atlas project, it's so necessary, so important. And the work that you have done is amazing. So at the end, at the Q&A, you will see um, you have a lot of fans of your project and we want to hear more about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. I will now uh, introduce our second speaker for this panel, uh, Rudo Kemper. I already introduced you. So Rudo, if you want to take it on from here and we are ready for your talk. Great, yeah, thanks so much, Anna. And uh, hi everyone, it's a real honor to be here with you today at this uh, very special uh, Barry Lawrence Rudiman Conference on cartography dedicated to indigenous mapping. I'm super inspired by what Tucker Ray just shared. It's phenomenal work and really just an inspiration to everyone. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here presenting alongside some old friends and allies and learning from other folks that are doing just fascinating and amazing research and work and practice. And uh, grateful to, you, to the organizers as well for this opportunity to share with you. So let me share my screen. Is that coming through okay? Yes, we can see it well. Great, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my talk today is titled um, on autonomy and digital, and digital um, approaches to participatory indigenous mapping. Uh, so the focus here is not so much about historical maps about indigenous lands, but um, rather are maps that are being made directly by indigenous peoples themselves and any practices around where indigenous people own and control the mapping processes. And uh, basically what I'd like to do is pose some questions around whether digital approaches to participatory mapping in indigenous lands can actually lead to more autonomy or ownership in those processes. And then I'll reflect on those questions and share some thoughts based on my own experience working in solidarity with indigenous communities. Uh, so just a little bit about me to start with. I'm a geographer and a technologist by training, uh, currently working with a nonprofit organization called Digital Democracy as a practitioner um, in mapping. So Digital Democracy, we're an organization that partners with marginalized communities to build and utilize tools that protect human and environmental rights. Um, originally from the Netherlands and Curacao, an island in the Caribbean, and now living in Springfield, Virginia, which is the traditional homeland of Piscataway and Nachcochang peoples. And my background is in working with indigenous peoples on participatory mapping projects for the past 10 years, um, initially in the Amazon, but now also uh, supporting communities in Kenya and Canada. Uh, so just by way of orientation, again, emphasizing that I'll be talking about indigenous mapping, so referring to the practice um, of indigenous peoples to kind of take advantage of this power of cartography by creating their own maps as a way of uh, countering Western narratives of empty lands and reclaiming their land rights or resisting encroaching extractivism. So this is a digital map that was made by the Warani community in Ecuador of their ancestral lands, where you can see uh, resources and places of cultural importance within their territory. Um, it's on the website of Amazon Frontlines if you want to check it out. And a different version can actually also be found in the uh, digital exhibition of this conference for Edson Cornock's talk. So I'm just showing this here as an example of what I'll be talking about. And um, yeah, just before getting started and thinking about autonomy, um, I thought I'd start by sharing an insight that I've learned from indigenous people in South America over the years about why digital technology is a valuable thing and why it can be important uh, to learn to use digital tools. Um, yeah, for maintaining culture and territory. So I once spent some time with the Kogi people in the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta in Colombia, and I was giving a workshop on recording and mapping oral histories. And the subject of why it can be good to adopt digital technologies came up um, when I asked the question of why it might be important to video record oral histories about the land. So I posed that as kind of as a question as for reflection and there was a bit of silence for a while. And one of the younger people uh, at the workshop said something that I'll never forget. Um, he said that his culture has always been one of orally transmitted histories and traditions, but before they only worked with two visions, the physical and the spiritual. Uh, but today they need a third vision, which is that of technology. And he said that technology is like an ax. If it can be used improperly, it can chop down many trees. And that is why the people of the Sierra need to control and manage technology so it doesn't turn against them. So basically before it wasn't necessary to use this vision because they were alone, but now that others have entered into their territory it is required to ensure that his culture would remain alive before his generation. And that's why he wants to learn to use digital tools uh, for mapping and recording oral histories. And I thought that this was just one of the most profound ways of describing why digital tools are important for maintaining traditional culture. Um, thought I would share it with you as well. So digital technology wasn't necessary before, but today it is vital uh, for the defense of land and culture because of the presence of outsiders in the territory. 
Um, so without pivoting more directly to the subject of autonomy, um, there's a few questions that I'd like to raise in advance and that I'll reflect on. And I'm inviting others to you know, consider the same questions. I don't necessarily think I have the answers, but I want to raise them because I think they're some of the most important uh, questions for us to consider when thinking about digital approaches. So you know, the first one here is like, why are many indigenous mapping projects frequently only participatory to an extent? So we talk about participatory mapping, but it tends to only be participatory in the initial phases when it comes to data collection. Um, and then it's, it's, after that, somebody has to kind of step in and take over and, and help with the analysis or the processing or the cartography. Uh, this is frequently the case, especially in you know, the global South and South America and Africa and in some other places as well. Um, secondly, what are the conditions that lead digital approaches to indigenous mapping to create dependency on an outside expert or ally? So sort of related, again, thinking about like the conditions in a participatory mapping project that lead to um, a, a relationship where somebody has to step in continuously to sort of help out with the process. Um, thirdly, so to what extent can digital tools developed with, for, and by indigenous communities interrupt this pattern of external dependency and lead to more community autonomy in the mapping process? So when we're talking about co-creating tools with indigenous communities, does that break that kind of relationship of dependency? And then just lastly here, recognizing that digital mapping tools are not a solution in and of themselves. Are there good practices in project design and implementation for an indigenous mapping project? Um, so what I'd like to do is basically tell you about two different moments that I've been privileged to be a part of uh, supporting indigenous mapping projects, and then to draw out some observations about these questions uh, during each. And then I'll conclude by telling you about a new resource that is actively drawing from lessons learned uh, like these. So to start off here, I'd like to tell you about a few experiences in indigenous mapping work in Suriname, where I've been working for the past decade. So this is a photo of a really beautiful hand-drawn map that was made in the late 90s by the man holding it, whose name is Wuta Wajinu. It's a map of uh, Tereno lands, indigenous lands, which is an area of roughly 3 million hectares in Southern Suriname. And Wuta was asked by his chieftain to make this map as a way to demonstrate to the government that the community has ancestral connections to this land and therefore should have land rights over it. So the map in and of itself, it's like an incredible work of cartography. I mean, you can't see it here because I'm blurring it to protect the community knowledge, but it was all hand drawn in the village with knowledge from the elders informing a rich amount of information about historical sites, spiritual sites, natural resources over an incredibly extensive area. I mean, people were kind of drawing this out or Wuta was drawing this out sort of from his own memory of just the contours and the shapes of the rivers, just an incredible, uh, phenomenal project. And so why did Wuta make this map? Um, even the photo where you can see Wuta kind of staring into the camera sort of reveals who he is showing it to, right? A sort of a world of outsiders who need this map to understand what the Tereno see in their forest. But the map, what was beautiful, um, it wasn't legible to outsiders, right? It wasn't something that you could just bring to the government as a way to kind of demonstrate the value of the land that the community had. And so they had to look for outside support to have it make an impact. So they approached an NGO uh, called the Amazon Conservation Team to use GIS software to digitize Wuta's map and then to overlay it with the official aerial maps of the government. Uh, they did this in 2001, along with some other maps that were produced by other community members. And so here, what you see is a photo of a formalized cartographic map um, being formally presented in the, fair, in the village. So this is all before my time working in Suriname, but the reason I share it is because I think it's a very representative case of how indigenous mapping took place historically, and in many cases, in some, uh, still, still takes place today. So again, it's participatory because it's indigenous knowledge being mapped or collected by community members, but only to a certain point. So the NGO um, researcher or ally has to step in and take over and kind of, again, digitize and visualize the data. So this was in 2001. So that then raises the question of whether the newer tools are any better or easier to use. So me personally, I started working with the Amazon conservation team in 2013. And uh, one of the first things that I worked on was to try to upgrade the mapping workflows that the organization was using with their partner communities in Suriname. So by this time, GPS handhelds, you know, garments had already come into the picture and community members were using these to record data in the fields. And the mappers would take waypoints on the GPS and then they would write down the coordinates on paper with a short description. That was kind of the system that they were using. Um, ACT would then have to collect the papers and process the data and then use it to make maps. So again, kind of participatory mapping in the data phase and then with a very high learning curve. 
I mean, some of the reasons for that are, you know, Garmin GPSs are not exactly easy to learn. Uh, the user interface is not at all intuitive. You have to use it with a Western system language. Uh, the concept of coordinates are abstract. So there were just a lot of issues and basically the community was entirely dependent um, on ACT to constantly give refresher trainings and uh, of course process all the data. So uh, one of the things my team worked on was to try to use smartphone apps like Open Data Kit, which is what you're seeing on the right there uh, to improve that process. So what you can do in ODK, Open Data Kit, is you can design your own forms and have them be in whatever language you want. Uh, so we tried to do some participatory form design where the mappers uh, schemed out the structure of the forms in paper. And then a day later, would have them baked into ODK, ready to use uh, for field mapping. Our theory was that this would make for an easier to use digital tool. And since the mappers were involved in a form design from the beginning, there would be more ownership over the process. And largely, the mappers did definitely report that they had a, a more solid grasp of the mapping process using this tool and that it was easier to use, especially because we could translate the forms. Um, so while the NGO field was in the field for a few, a few weeks for the NGO team, excuse me, uh, we went on several expeditions where things went really well. So the mappers had confidence in using the tools and everybody felt good about it. Um, but after we left, two things broke down in the system. So uh, first, the ODK form uh, collection system relies on submitting data to an internet server and then for someone to download it, process it and bring it back. So it's still the same kind of system of reliance on external support and also the internet being an issue there. And you know the data wasn't immediately useful. It relied on the NGO to do this final step. Um, and secondly, we discovered that the momentum of using the tool was kind of tied to us being present in the field to run the workshops. And I'll actually return to this point when I talk about the um, a different uh, mapping project with the Ogiak in Kenya. Uh, but for now, just observing a super common trend when an NGO is the main driver of a mapping project, and then the project comes to a halt when the NGO staff leaves. And you know, in this case, we thought we were kind of co-designing forms and that that would lead to more autonomy. But because it was primarily being pushed forward by us as the NGO staff, the momentum stopped when we left because the drive for the project was coming from us and uh, not from the community. So around the same time as this work with the Terreno, um, ACT started a project with a different community in Suriname called the Matawai, which is a community of descendants of formerly enslaved Africans who escaped from slavery and fought for their right to exist in a rainforest. Uh, they've lived in what is now their ancestral land for over 300 years, and so they have extensive knowledge and stories about the history of the forest. So in 2015, they wanted to make maps of their land to get a sense of where the threats, um, environmental pressures, you know, like logging and mining were located. And so ACT started a ma participatory mapping project with them upon invitation. So very much in a similar style as with the Terreno, uh, training community members to do sketch mapping and use GPS units and so on. Now, one thing that came out of that work actually was storytelling. And you know this is this has been talked about uh, at this conference and also by folks like Steve DeRoy from the Firelight Collective or Jim Minote, who's a Zuni cartographer, um, about how this map making process with communities can really bring out a lot of story, and how it can really awake the memories of the elders who hold the most knowledge. And that's what happened with the Matawai. So as the young Matawai mappers started to work with the community elders, uh, just this tremendous amount of oral history about the first times that their ancestors first arrived in these lands came out. And the community realized it was really important to document these stories alongside the maps because the young people hadn't heard most of these stories and they felt that there was kind of a risk of them being lost in time. So one of the community-based organizations uh, together with ACT started a new project to record some of these uh, most precious place-bound oral histories and they wanted to put them on the map. So in that moment, we kind of started to dream a bit again about the possibilities of digital technology. You know, like, can there be an application that can combine the Matawais maps with the oral histories about the lands that is tailor-made for teaching young people? Uh, can it work entirely offline in the rainforest uh, to avoid dependency on the internet, like what happened with the open data kit system? Can it be made with principles of indigenous data sovereignty and with full control over the data baked into it? And we couldn't really find an application that could do all that, so maybe we could build one together with the Matawai. So uh, long story short, uh, we worked with a volunteer developer collective to build something, and that tool became Terra Stories. It's a free and open source tool uh, that can be used by any community across the globe uh, to overlay place-based stories on their own maps and make decisions about setting certain stories as restricted or protected. And it can work entirely offline. So here you have maps of Matawai lands, and then you have a sidebar showing the recordings that were made by, by the community of the elders sharing stories. So the Matawai can either pan across the map um, and click on places to view stories, or they can navigate to a place after viewing a story. So once you viewed it, you can see where it took place. 
Uh, you can translate the entire interface to a local language and make it feel like your own uh, by putting in your own icons for things like the home button on the map. And you can also set stories as restricted so that only users with permissions to listen or watch those stories have access. It's a simple but really powerful app. And you know, when we've done demos in the community, for example, at the local grade schools, it's just amazing to see how the kids gravitated towards the application and were really drawn into the stories and for them to learn about the places that are part of their daily lives. You know, like there's this granite rock in the river behind the school where they jump off to go swimming after class that has this amazing story. Um, and so for them to learn about these places that they have incredible histories through the wards of the elders, as it's always been done, um, it's just incredible. And so for the school teachers who are like really in need of helpful materials, here you've got this app that can teach geography, history, computer literacy, culture, all in one, in a way that speaks to the kids' lived experiences. Um, so for us, it's really demonstrated the phenomenal power of a digital mapping app when it's done right. Um, but there were downsides as well to this kind of co-creation process. So Terra Stories is all volunteer built, and we were working on finishing like a minimally useful product even the night before we showed Terra Stories to the Matawai. Uh, so this is a photo of my colleague Kalimar, um, who was debugging something about the app, like literally in the middle of the jungle at a guest house we were staying at. Uh, we were showing like a, we were using a projector to show the screen on the wall when there was like a few hours of power from the village generator, uh, just cramming to get it at least minimally functioning by the next morning. And yeah, like at the early stages when we introduced it to the community and the local ACT field coordinator, there were definitely still some kinks to work out and bugs that came up. And that led to a lot of hesitation and well, skepticism about the readiness of the app and really limited the early uptake. And, you know, installing the app, this is kind of, this is open source code, so it's kind of messy. Um, it's not exactly easy. You have to run a few lines of command line uh, code and we wrote really solid documentation, but it's still intimidating for folks that don't have basic computer skills, right? Um, so, the, the many computers that were equipped with Terra Stories for the Matawai, they sat around for a really long time at the NGO offices. They weren't being used and somewhat forgotten after the project cycle was done. So today the app is in a much better shape and other communities have had better experiences using it. But that was kind of a big lesson learned for us early on um, about not introducing technology too early. So on that note, a few quick takeaways and lessons from this work uh, with digital mapping tools in Suriname. Uh, for complete local autonomy over mapping in remote areas, avoid using tools that rely on the internet. Look for tools with an offline first design. Um, like if you try to apply tools that rely on the internet somehow, it's, it's part of what seeds that relationship of dependency, right? On somebody who can go and process that data. Uh, localization is really important. So tools that can be translated and made to feel like it's the community's own tool help with local uptake. So the tool, tools that can be customized to some capacity or even co-designed with the community are tremendously valuable for uh, pr promoting local ownership. Um, consider that when introducing mapping tools or any digital tools, really, if you don't do it right, you may end up seeding a stubborn relationship of dependency on you or other support to maintain or troubleshoot. I think that was clear in the story that I just shared. If you're an outsider and involved in training, don't set up a dynamic where you are the expert. Instead, focus on building local capacity to the point where there are trainers that feel empowered to train others. And just lastly, again, co-creation of tools can be very powerful, but be careful not to introduce half-built tech or make people feel like test subjects because it can lead to frustration and disappointment. These are some of like the intricacies of the kind of work that we do with digital democracy as a nonprofit that focuses on building technology specifically for and with indigenous peoples, um, that we are co-creating tools, but at the same time, we have to kind of trial them and ensure that they are um, um, conforming to what the users are interested in. And, you end up stuck in that dynamic sometimes where it's not quite ready. Um, and then you end up with, yeah, some frustration locally. So that's actually a good segue into a, a second moment that I wanted to share about, which is a project um, with Digital Democracy Now, where we are uh, supporting the Ogiek indigenous people of Mount Elgon in Kenya to use a tool called Mapeo. Um, so this is actually, this is also a participatory mapping project that is a collaboration between ourselves, uh, an organization called Forest Peoples Program, and a community-based Ogiek organization called the Chepkitale Indigenous Peoples Development Project, or CIPDP. And the goal of this project is to map Ogiek customary or ancestral land, which is much larger uh, than the one community land reserve that the Ogiek currently have rights to, which you can see is this kind of green area at the top of the mountain on the map. Uh, the rest of their lands were given away by the colonial government to farmers and then later turned into forest reserves. So the Ogiek, what they want to do is collect mapping data about their customary tenure to using court to petition for land rights. Uh, so for the past six years or so, digital democracy has been building 
an amazing tool uh, called Mapeo, which is a mapping and data collection tool that has been closely co-created with indigenous peoples. It's free, it's open source, it works entirely offline, it's easy to set up, it can be customized and translated, and it uses a sophisticated uh, decentralized data sharing system called peer-to-peer. -peer. So the proposal was for us to work with CIPDP uh, to use Mapeo, and that this would all start off with a kickoff training on using Mapeo in the field, um, led by ourselves. So in some ways, that traditional model of training communities to use a digital tool that I described earlier, albeit a much better tool. So everyone was super excited about this project, um, which is also Digital Democracy's first time working with a community in Africa to use Mapeo. And then right as the project took off, the pandemic hit. And instead of flying off to Kenya to start this amazing project, this was our reality, which is of course familiar to everyone. <laughs> um, the entire project was upended and we didn't quite know how to start. So that took a few months of just meeting and trying to figure out if we can somehow be able to travel until we just gave up on that and focused on our energies on making it work remotely. It was honestly pretty tough at first because we couldn't really benefit from any of the usual, you know, in-person dynamism of starting a participatory mapping project with sketch mapping and having everyone kind of get together and design legend icons and so on. And instead we were on Skype, so sort of uh, staring at a spreadsheet together to figure out what the community wanted to map uh, while dealing with not seeing each other and poor internet and so on. So it took a really long time. Um, but things started to come together eventually. So with Mapeo, one of the great things you can do is you can really customize the legend of what you want to map and create your own icons and translations that you can see on the right there. And once we did that, we started to do some remote trainings where the CIPDP mapping team would gather in one, one room. And then my colleague, Tom from FPP would be doing the trainings as in this photo. And our approach was just to kind of re replicate the typical training dynamic as much as possible. Like having folks go outside and map different features and then coming back inside to review the data that's been collected. And it was actually pretty seamless once we got started and the mapping team reported feeling quite good about, you know, having mastered the tool afterwards. Um, so what happened next was really amazing. So CIPDP wanted to do some mapping workshops with the community following this training. And they just kind of ran with it based on the remote trainings that we did and some guides that we prepared. So the team disappeared into a remote context up the mountain for about a week as they, um, yeah, as they traveled. And then when they came back, they reported having trained three mappers from all of the Ogiek villages, which are eight in total, and that everyone went on expeditions across the Ogiek landscape. And then when we got together on Skype, um, and reviewed the data they collected, like we, we couldn't believe it. They had mapped nearly a thousand points for an area spanning almost 24,000 hectares. And a lot of it, again, outside of the boundaries of the Chepkitale Reserve, which is the goal of the project. And when we put all that data on a map, which you can see here, um, it was clear that this was not just a massively impressive work and accomplishment over a few weeks, um, not only training community members, but really driving the data collection work in an amazing way. And again, this was all uh, via a project that was supposed to start off with in-person accompaniment and ended up not having any at all, but with the community mappers just taking complete ownership over everything. Um, so for us, this raised some very interesting questions as we started to think about it more. Like for sure, it helps when the digital tools are created with and for communities and are easy to adopt and customize, but maybe we also need to decolonize our approach to field work and stop imagining that our presence in the field is needed at all or at worst can prevent a strong sense of autonomy in taking on the mapping process from emerging, as I've mentioned. So definitely not to take away, you know, again, from the value of in-person accompaniment. And we all so much, we miss so much by being not in person and especially with indigenous communities where, you know, building trust and reciprocity is so vital. Um, but it's just, there's a lesson here about not always placing too much import on the value of field work. And that in some cases, remote accompaniment can be just as effective, um, if not encourage more autonomy. So that ties into my last point of discussion here, um, which is all about sharing knowledge and best practices around the use of technology in an autonomous way um, via a new platform called the Earth to Funders Toolkit. So this is um, a platform that we launched this summer with the goal of sharing a lot of these kinds of lessons learned in our years of collective work and solidarity with indigenous partners and really take seriously this idea of promoting approaches to using digital tools that encourage autonomy and reduce dependency. So, uh, we built the EDT Earth of Thunders Toolkit after months of research about what is and isn't working with our partners and asking what the constant pain points are of using technology in the field and with the goal of creating resources, guides, and materials that are directly for the benefit of, of community members. So the platform is built to kind of provide easy pathways for communities to find the tools or approaches that they need. So just showing you some of what's inside the first version, uh, here's a feature we built called the Tool Finder 
This is kind of thinking to the abundance of existing digital tools and how it can be hard to figure out which one is going to work best for you. Um, so we built an interface where you can indicate specifically what you want to use tools for, what you have access to, and your specific needs. And then based on that, the EDT um, Earth Defender Toolkit will generate a bespoke list of tools for you uh, based on your responses, which you can print out and take with you. And it also describes kind of the, uh, the benefits and the pros and cons of each of the tools, specifically thinking about indigenous use cases. Um, we're also providing guides on getting started, for example, with a mapping project. Uh, so very often when a community wants to use a digital mapping tool, like for example, when we get an inquiry about using Mapeo, they're not just asking about how to use the tool, right? They're also trying to figure out how to get started, um, how to put together a budget, how to put together a team and thinking through objectives that they want to achieve besides just like how the tool works. Um, so we have some guides on getting started and some framing questions to ask at the beginning stages. We also have case studies about communities that have used digital tools to successfully take action on defending their lands or accomplishing another goal. So one example is actually a case study on the Matawai in Suriname, who I shared about earlier, and really indicating clearly how they went about mapping their oral histories in, in a kind of a step-by-step -step way, almost like a recipe to follow, uh, what tools they used, what all went into it, so that someone can have a clear understanding of what it took for them to go about their project that they might adapt in their own context. There's also featured tool guides uh, specifically written for the benefit of indigenous other frontline communities. Um, you know, too often in software and tool development, we write guides that are more written for an audience of people like ourselves, kind of with a framing, like here's how you work with a community to do X. And that means for communities that ends up seeding that dependency for you to help them later down the road. Uh, so these are guides that are written specifically for communities. So ideally they can work with the tools without needing that additional support. Um, and then we have this knowledge sharing series called the Seed Bank, where we share insights about the use of digital tools in practice and really draw on lessons like the ones that I shared before. Uh, so here's one about how technology introduced during a project may have unexpected impacts. Uh, for example, um, introduction of smartphone can serve mobile app mapping applications, but they can also cause social tension and inflate the status of participants with access to the tools. Here's another example that's like pretty relevant to this talk about how training in digital tools should be accompanied by training in basic tech literacy. Uh, because very often uh, we focus on training in a tool and kind of a step-by-step -step way, but as soon as something goes wrong or somebody accidentally presses the wrong button, the process breaks down and then folks with less tech literacy, they don't know how to get back to the same tool or the same process. And just lastly, one here on how mapping projects can help revitalize processes of traditional knowledge transmission, which was kind of mentioned with the Matawai, uh, discussing how when elders or knowledge keepers are invited to think about the territory, it can be a helpful prompt uh, to remember or share. And then the elders can become motivated to share their traditional knowledge again through a mapping project because their knowledge is actively solicited. Um, just finishing up here, another component of the Earth Defenders Toolkit is creating spaces for community to convene, discuss, and learn from each other. So a few months ago, we held um, an Earth Africa Forum for Earth Defenders where we had over 120 people join uh, to share knowledge about struggles and approaches across the continents and also connect with each other. And uh, lastly, just naming that this platform is an open project to which anyone can contribute, either by creating new materials, providing translations, or working on the tools. And so we're really looking forward to learning what else we can provide, uh, creating more materials next year. So if you have any feedback after checking it out, let us know, because we really want this to be a resource that's as useful as possible to Indigenous communities that are interested in using digital tools um, and doing so with as much autonomy as possible. And just lastly, um, in conclusion here, I want to leave you with a quote uh, from one of our community partners in Ecuador, who is Opin Nankimo from the Waurani community, uh, concluding thoughts that I think apply really well to the potential and limitations of digital approaches to indigenous mapping. So digital technology can help, but it can't inherently solve everything or anything. It's up to us to make it work for ourselves. And that's it for me. So uh, thank you so much. And I really look forward to the discussion um, and any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rudo. This was a fascinating presentation. Um, was, uh, I'm going to download the EDT on my, on my phone. <laughs> I work on indigenous communities as well in Mexico. So this has been really um, illustrating and helpful. Okay, uh, now I'm going to introduce our last panelist, um, Tanya Wolfgram. Um, we'll continue with her talk. And then at the end, we will have the Q&A. And please remember, uh, if you have questions, instead of typing them 
in the chat, type them in the Q&A box, because if you type them in the chat, I may not see them all. So please, um, if you already wrote them, just copy paste them. Okay, so our next speaker, Tanya Wolfgram, we're ready. Ko te moana nui a kiwa, te moana, ko kalia tonga kura haupo ma tātua ngā waka, a vatu tonga aotearoa ngā motu, talao tawhiridahi, tarekeha ngā maunga, ulu kalala te opori whakatohea ngā iwi, veta talo pōtahi opa pe te marae, lāwaki Wolfgram Kapahega te kainga, ko te vita rawa ko Horiana, o ko matua ko aotania hari ki te rā tapuweruelu Wolfgram, E ngā mana, ngā reo, ngā haue whā, ngā taia whā, te ngā koutou, ngā iwi taketake o te ao. Kao moana, kaupapa, raurangatira mā, te ngā koutou, te ngā koutou, te ngā tātou katoa. Greetings everybody, uh, I am Tanya Wolfgram, and what I have just done is provided you with a snapshot, a map if you like, in my language of who I am and where I am from. That included my ocean, my canoes, my islands, mountains, tribes, homelands, my kinships, and my parents. And of course, first and foremost, I identify as a person of Oceania. And I recall uh, one of our Tongan scholars who talked about Oceania as vast, expanding, hospitable, and generous, um, and that we would not be defined by the smallness of our ocean, uh, of our islands, but the greatness of our ocean. So I'll just start my slideshow. Great to be here in, in this early morning. Um, and here we are. And I will share that and display settings. This one. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Um, Te Hamuana Mapping Ocean Views. And so what I'm going to talk about is how um, I do work, we do work across the Pacific, and I've started with a slide of Kupe. Um, I just want to check that you guys can see this. Yes, you should be able to. Kupe is a master navigator and map maker, and this is a um, carved representation. My husband, we cook king, is a, we call him a tohunga whakairo, um, and we've carved the largest Māori Pacific totem in the world at uh, over 80 feet high, and Kupe is a master navigator and map maker. So this morning I'm just going to explore um, some of our histories. So as a person of the Pacific, um, our ancestors were known as kai vai, or eaters of water. That's literally eaters, kai, and vai is water. Pacific Ocean is over 60 million square miles, about 40 million people, 25,000 islands, and um, our languages are thousands of years old. Obviously, our cultures and people span from the west to Taiwan. It even went back towards uh, Madagascar, and of course, Aotearoa, New Zealand in the south, Rapa Nui in the east, and Hawaii up in the north. So map making, our ancestors were brilliant map makers. They were... Um, even the language that we used in, in Māori, we use this word māhere, and um, mā is, our language has um, many elements to it. And so mā is an incredible word that talks about uh, direction, so it's directional, meaning by way of, and towards relational, and with four and numerical linking, linking numbers, tens and hundreds. That second part here is, is um, to do with it's, it's a word we use for a different article, but it always means that we're exploring. We're never quite at the tear where we turn it into a definite. And it always infers action. So we've always considered map making as, um, as something that's very dynamic and, um, you know, a work in progress all the time. Uh, our ancestors used the star compass, so... Um, uh, the, it divides the 360 degrees around the canoe. So each each of our waka or canoes had these star compasses and were in and of themselves a compass as they moved across the oceans. And they moved very far. I mean, we went across those millions of miles. As a, a, my Tongan ancestors went all the way to South America. Um, they mapped the oceans, and not only did they um, map from the, I call it multidimensional because it's from the expanse of the heavens, the stars, moon, sun, the skies, the seas, the surfaces, all the way to the depths of the ocean. 
and um, they were incredible researchers, analysts, evaluators, um, and not only that, but also um, genealogically linked through uh, representations, the Sky Father, Rangi Nui, there's um, some Kav representations on this slide, um, Tane, the god of the forests, and Tangaroa, the god or uh, creator spirit of the oceans. So here's just a map of Vava'u Tonga, where my um, father is from. Um, so they were, it was like, it was like the street view, it was like the Google Maps for thousands of years. Every passage was named, the islands, the trenches, the channels, reefs, um, sea mounts. They understood the patterns, um, how the whales um, would, would come up to Vava'u Tonga, go past down um, in, October, they'd come and give birth um, between about July and October, and then travel back down to um, Aotearoa and onto the Antarctic in uh, late October. Um, go past our friends at Ngaitahu. Um, at flights and migration, essentially streets. So they were very comprehensive um, for thousands of years. And as I mentioned, when we were in um, Peru recently, uh, a couple of years back, you could see artifacts like the um, hikuleo of Tonga, the Tonga, the Tonga goddess and representations in Pachacamac, uh, south of Lima, and also the tapa designs and patterns as well. That's how um, comprehensive they were. So who are we and what do we do? Um, global Reach Initiative and Development, um, myself and my um, partner and our team have been um, really working across the islands for the past few years. And I'd just like to start this by showing you a video of um, some of the work and why we do it. So I'm going to click into a video now of Mapping Tonga. Welcome to Tonga. It's about 500 or so miles south of Fiji, comprises roughly 180 islands and about 36 of those are inhabited. Hello, Lele. Hello, Lava Mai. Ko Tani Wolfram. So, yeah, this is Pango Motu. And on this little island we're standing on right here, there's eight people. We're going to put this little island of Pango Motu into street view using the GoPro Fusion. Background is in academia. I was an anthropologist back in the day, Tony was in psychology. In the last 20 to 30 years, I've been on this journey of working in small communities around the world, basically for indigenous development and helping communities to move forward in their own kind of self-discovery. We met some people from Google and Google Street View, and they were talking about how wonderful it was and how you could see things in all these cities around the world. And when we said to them, well, you keep talking about, you know, London and New York and Paris, but what about the Pacific? Why isn't there any Google Street View in the Pacific Islands? Our goal is to Street View all of Tonga. Cookie made a rig for us to put the Insta360 on top of the car. We shoot in 8K, five frames. I tend to do segments of roughly about 10 to 15 minutes because it's a bit more manageable for stitching and uploading. The last part of the puzzle, of course, is that once we go, we have to have a team behind us that can keep the maintenance of the information up to date. And also perhaps go to some of the other islands where there's several people living. This is the island of Ava'u. Now, where my father, Tehita Tapuerwele Wolfram, was born. This beautiful port of refuge for canoes and boats for thousands of years. This is our very first road and island in Mabau that we'll be street viewing. In the last census, there was about 194 people living on this island. And then after this, week, we've got five more villages on some of the outer islands. We're using a backpack so that we can have somebody fit on the mountain bike. Thank you, everybody, and all of our friends for actually making all of this happen and bringing us to the level. There you go. Hey, once you ride a bike, you can always ride a bike. Woo. 
there's a specific person who to our identity is we believe we are the ocean and the ocean is us. To bring that into focus with what we saw street view is an ability for people to connect with their homeland, those that have left. There's also the ability for the global audience to look at stories about our identity. The commons, like the connection to the land and your village, it's just huge. And everybody knows the village and land that they came from, but they can't see it. When I was flying today, I was just thinking about my dad, his name is Denita. He got kidney failure about um, six or so years ago. Kidney failure for a person living in Tonga is a death sentence. Fortunately, my dad had uh, New Zealand citizenship. He was able to get an assist, but at that very moment, he could not come back to Tonga. Right. So, um, yeah. So that's, that's the some of the reason of why we do it. Uh, why we do this work to create our own maps to help us to answer these questions. Kawai o, kawai koi, kawai mato. Like, who are we? And when I use that word why, it is, um, as I mentioned before, um, a word which is a very ancient word across Polynesia, why or why. And when there's kind of multiple levels to it. So we would say, who are you? Kawai koi. Um, what is your water? Kawaiko is like, what is your water? How do you connect to your oceans or seas or rivers or lakes? And another level is Y is in, um, includes Wa, which is space, time, and E, which infers your divinity. So it's like, how are you energizing your divinity in this space and time? And that's kind of at the essence of why, like, who are you? And then I say, Koao, Koao, I am Timuan, I'm the ocean. So when I ask you again, kawai koi, then you connect me to your um, to your lands, your whenua. Um, so we say kwa te whenua, I'm the land, we are kopapa, people of the land. So this is a whare, and um, Takere showed some beautiful pictures of his um, marae and whares earlier. Um, a marae or whare nui, uh, the long house, the big house, is a multi-dimensional living map. These are carved by um, Tohonga, as I mentioned, my husband is one, and they're read um, with genealogical links to our ancestors, to each other, to our kins, to our tribe. And we are ourselves, Marae, when we're in repose. Um, so just very briefly, one of my tribes, Te Whakatohia, um, had lived for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years on our land, right by the ocean, um, we were invaded by the Crown, a fairly typical story of colonization, Crown warships and cavalry in 1865 and had 400,000 acres of land stolen at that time. And of course, you know, the story of colonial land surveyings and mapping as being a key element of the confiscation process. So. Um, after this invasion um, and loss of life, 
and loss of land, they were divided up through this, these maps and surveys between Crown, soldiers and various other people, um, breaches of our treaties. And then 160 years or so later, we'd be for, lucky if we get back up 1% of our land and resources as, as return and compensation. So telling of those stories is really critical for, our, um, for us moving forward. So then coming back to the why, so for us, for me, and for our team, it's really about everything we do is about sovereignty. And there's a, a Māori word, tino rangatiratanga, which is um, sort of an amplifier of leadership, the systematization of leadership and sovereignty. And it's sovereignty of who we are, of our world, our worldview to our Māori, of our food and water, kai and wai, of our whenua, of our reo, of our wakas, our canoes, of our whare our homes, of our, our tikanga, the way we do things, our ethics and protocol, and of our technology, um, of our hangaro, um, of how we empower each other through our methodologies, and of course, the mahere. And here's a picture here of um, one of my um, uncles who sadly passed away, Ranginu Walker, who, who talked at length about this in his um, books, Ka Whai Whai Tonu Mato, Struggle Without End, and of course, a very really well-known um, political activist, uh, uh, Tamiiti. So really, why do we do it? Sovereignty is, is behind it. And how do we do it? So um, the, one of the key elements and, and what happened earlier on was when I um, met with some um, people from Google, as I said, it was like, well, just because, you know, some of the huge corporations have technical capability doesn't mean that they have the cultural knowledge or cultural intelligence or cultural capability. So um, thinking about Tonga, for example, I've always said there's a right time and a wrong time for mapping to, to go ahead. And um, small communities, um, when there's things like um, tr some tragedy and trauma, for example, in Tonga, we lost uh, so many people at a ferry drowning. Um, that um, the whole country was in mourning and that was not the right time. So thinking about um, kotahi, how we actively engage and, and connect with people, manaki is a, is a core value of um, supporting and, and kaitiakitanga or kaitiaki is how we protect and preserve um, what people are doing and, and, and how we, we, we help people and communities to thrive and grow. And so he's um, just from um, the, the homeland of my father. Um, considerations, obviously, population, how are we going to do it, where we're going to approach it, what would we require, all the technical equipment, you know, anything from bikes to horses to cars to um, launches and so forth. And here's um, one of the first um, images of, of, of Tongatapu the big CBD, the big smoke, the intersection that we published in Google um, 2017. And um, also another thing that work that we did was uh, post-cyclone. So there's my daughter Darcy. We went in, there was a Category 4 or 5 cyclone, Gita, in February 2018. There was widespread destruction across the island and a state of emergency declared there was no power at the time. So we flew in and we did street view across Tongatapu um, and mapping, which is, you know, 8K, 360 degree mapping, um, you know, dodging sort of power poles and, and so forth. Um, and then we, because there, there wasn't internet capability in the islands, we, we bring the um, data back and do all the stitching and processing and uploading and so forth um, in New Zealand. So here's an example of um, the old parliament building, pre-Gita, um, pre pre-Cyclone Gita, and post, um, which you can see was like totally destroyed at the time. And luckily I was also able to get back to the birthplace of my dad. Um, from the video that you saw, uh, my father ended up with kidney failure and um, I used to take him to dialysis um, and, you know, it's sit there with my computer. And I was just thinking at the time, you know, if only I could see things differently. And then when the opportunity came up to go to Vava'u, unfortunately, Dad had already passed away at the time. But I've had feedback from thousands of people all over the world who are just so 
happy to be able to see the islands and villages. So really these maps can be transformational, quite timeless. We, we integrate traditional knowledge. There's my other daughter, Yani, with the NC Tech outside Port Kapua, right next to Port Kapua. Um, they strengthen the relationships and the stories that we have to our, to our ancestors um, and to the world, and to each other. So another project we did with um, Google Earth is called the Te, Te Hamuana Ocean Voices Project. And that was mapping um, 10 languages from across the Pacific um, and available in the Google Earth Indigenous Languages layer. And so our languages are thousands of years old, over 9,000 years old, 40 distinct languages and a few dialects um, across the Pacific. But covering 60,000 square miles, it really is a testament to to how um, powerful um, the culture was right across that time and space. So here is um, we Kuki, my Horanga Tira, Kia Ora from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Haere mai ki tau toko i te rā e whakatū anō ngā iwi takitaki o te ao. Welcome, support this, this day, stand up for Indigenous people and their languages. So, so each layer has... Um, a greeting in it, the word for um, the word for mother, the word for water, and a chant. Um, generally, a chant about their language, and also pinpoints a place on the global map. So let's go to Maloile Lei. This is uh, my friend Aonof, Captain Aonofa Javier from Vava Utonga, um, and she is a captain of the traditional waka. And she says, um, Koe whānau anga ai tofuaa, i he ta'u kotoa pē, he okuma whāna pēa whaka off of whoki. Whales give birth here because it is warm and beautiful. So you can hear the language, see the language, see an interpretation. And yes, um, I encourage you all, once the borders are open, to come back to Tonga and go swimming with the whales. It's truly, truly incredible. And then we went to Wharehape in uh, the middle of Tahiti. So, um, haere mai rā i Tahiti o Tahiti nui mā rea rea. Welcome to Tahiti, Great Tahiti, the Golden. This is in Papenoa Valley, and, and it used to be called um, Haapai, which is like, again, links back to Tonga, um, which is so cool. That's Papa um, Eve Dudut, Papa Dudes. And then we moved to um, Rapa Nui. I orana kōrua, ka oho mai ki Rapanui i te henua o te moai. So um, they also call themselves te pito o te henua, or, you know, all the little islands across the across the um, Pacific. So they're the pito or the um, umbilical cord to the world. Um, so these are friends, Tomas and Luis, um, master sculptors. Uh, Rapanui is also, as you probably know, known as Isla de Pascua or Easter Island. It's truly an amazing, amazing island. And here's, um, here's an image of um, Ahotongariki. You've probably seen Ahotongariki, uh, the Rapa Nui Moai ancestors carved at Rako, uh, Rana, Rana Raraku. Um, and then they go down the Te Ara o Te Moai, which is the pathway of the Moai, um, you know, walk back to their village and then look back into their village. So there's some just absolutely incredible, amazing stories of, of all of these places. And now millions of people can see them. So um, aloha mai kako. This is Kaimana on Alani Barcase. E, e ola ka aina, e ola kako no e, let the land live so that we can prosper too. So, um, you know, do go on and have a look at this and listen because you can actually hear experts in, the, in those particular languages talking about these spaces, so absolute diversity. So the mapping um, that we do um, contributes to many things. It can contribute to disaster. Hello, Tanya. Um, I am yeah. very sorry to interrupt you, but you're going a little bit. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, we want to leave some time for the Q&A. So uh, if you could wrap up, uh, that would be wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. fine. So mapping uh, contributes to disaster management. It supports um, mapping infrastructure, um, contributes to better economic outcomes, supports economic resilience and cultural content, and we can share experiences with the world, cultural and ecotourism, and then our goal is to do more mapping and ongoing community development across the world. 
um, because we believe every island and every village and every person counts. And so um, we will continue to trailblaze and explore and map. And I just wanted to say thanks to so many of our, our friends and um, family and um, my dad and my grandma and others, including Moka and Steve, Stafford, Natalie, Rayleigh, and um, yeah, many more. So whakawhitai, sincere gratitude to everybody. Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, Tamia. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I feel very fortunate for having had to moderate this panel. Uh, all the contributions uh, really made us rethink um, what indigenous mapping practices should be in the 21st century. So I'd like to thank our speakers, um, Dakade Rudo and Tania, for their work. And now uh, I'm going to move on to the q and I got all the q and I, I got all the questions in the box. If you have any more questions to ask, uh, please type them directly in the q and I'm going to, there's so many, so I'm going to try to read them all. Uh, if I don't, we can um, continue this conversation via email. Okay, so the first question, uh, it's from Tasha Rabinowitz, um, and it is for Takere, I think, asking, I am curious, uh, Takere, if you ran into places that seem to have more than one place name, or conflicting spellings? And if so, how did you deal with them? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Cool, I'm not sure what's happening to my video, but uh, <clears throat> yes, we did. We, uh, there are instances where we've got two or three different Naitahu names for a feature. And how we approached it was that if there were um, authentic information sources for each of those individual place names, then they would both get recorded, definitely. So it came down to the, the information sources for each place name. And yes, we have a, a lake, <clears throat> one of our largest yearling lakes is called Te Kiti Ika a Rakai Hautu, Te Kiti Ika a Titikawa, and Te Waihora. And both those three names come from authentic sources. So if we can defend it and put a hand on our heart, say those names are correct, yes, you can have more than one name for a feature. Thank you, Dakare. Um, the first questions are for you. So I'm, I'm, you know, I will read that in that order. So Edward Lord is asking, saying, many thanks, Dakare, for this presentation. I learned from a Maori librarian at a gathering here in Ohlone territory last year that there are reference patches, secret esoteric patches of pristine forest, which act as a kind of baseline against which to measure environmental perturbations of the land by humans, indigenous and otherwise. Can you speak to this? Thanks, Ian Athendik. Uh, oh, look, I'm, I'm not too sure. I know like <clears throat> in Fjordland, which is the southern western part of the South Island, there's some pretty pristine native vegetation there, but Look, I, I'm not really qualified to, to answer that. Sorry. Tony might be able to know some information about that question. That is okay. Uh, something okay. to think about. Um, so the next question is also for Dakere uh, by Bertie Mandelbert. I am blown away by the ambition, scope, and success of the Nagai Tahu Digital Atlas Project. I can only imagine how much effort this project takes and has taken. Dakare Norton, could you speak a little bit about the staffing of the project and the funding? How do you manage to carry on developing the project? Now the website, year after year, in terms of funding and staffing. Yeah, so our, the work of our archive team is paid for by the tribe. So the tribe, um, as I sort of, met, sort of briefly mentioned, in the 1990s had a large settlement with the New Zealand government over historic breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, and that's allowed us to actually um, invest and build some capital, which funds our cultural re revitalization project. So it is funded, all that work represented is funded by the tribe itself. We have a team of six people and there's three of us that work part-time on the project. Um, and the thing that has happened is that because we've brought up so much love and momentum, um, there's a real demand for this to continue. And because we have spent quite a bit of effort building our infrastructure, 
in terms of our archive database and our cultural mapping database and their, um, I guess, their connected websites, it's really now a matter of populating um, with, with information. So the infrastructure is the big cost they've been taken care of and it's now maintenance. And the real issue we have actually is having access to our information that's held by the external institutions and that sort of thing there. And um, we've now finding because we've got these um, we've got these programs in place is that there's much more willingness for them to make the information available to us because we can make it accessible to sort of our people and to all New Zealanders. So, um, but yeah, it, it's maintained by the EWI pretty much, the, the whole funding regime. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Queen Walker asking, are there any issues with the adoption of traditional names of places being adopted for schools or other places? How do you ensure that these names maintain fidelity to the spirit meaning of the originals? Slide about school naming. He's talking about the slide about the school. Yeah, look, I think there's been a huge growth in New Zealand over the last probably 40 years about the recognition and restoration of, of Māori place names. I would say that, um, you know, um, you know, in the pre-1990s, it would have been pretty tough to, 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 to restore place names and a lot of opposition. Um, but now I think there's real growing maturity, maturity that um, communities want to see these place names restored. And, um, and when we, I guess, submit a place name to have official status, we get so many letters of support from the wider community and schools are really owning it now. Like we're getting promote, we're getting approached by so many schools in our area wanting to know what is the mighty place name for that region and how they could use it. So um, there's a willingness for, from schools to use our traditional mighty place names. And there is a real willingness from us to make that accessible. And essentially they're asking us to write their cultural narratives for them. So um, yeah. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And one last question for you from Mishuana Goeman. I know Maori are way ahead in data sovereignty and have many important leaders. Can you expand a bit on data sovereignty measures and mapping? What tools or how are precautions taken? I mean, I'm probably a more of a fan of iwi sovereignty that I think each iwi, each individual Maori tribe should be should have their own sovereignty and how these stories get told and how they should manage their data. So uh, I'm a I'm more of a believer in that every iwi has to has their right to manage their data on what they see fit and what works for Naito really well may not may not suit others that sort of thing there. So um, um, look, I, I'm more of a believer that each iwi should have the autonomy to control their own knowledge. Thank you. Okay, now uh, we have a question for Rudo Kemper from Catherine Bellamy. Please, could you talk more about how you manage protected information in your role as a creator's maintainers of the mapping software itself? How can it be guaranteed that indigenous holders of knowledge maintain their agency and control of information once it is shared with a database? And then she adds, many thanks to all presenters and organizers for these valuable discussions. Great, yeah, thanks, Catherine. It's a wonderful question. Um, it, and it's one of the needs that we hear about the most from our indigenous partners and just generally across the globe is just this need for controlling data and having full control over who has access to it, how it gets shared and on a local basis as well. Um, so the way that we approach that in terms of the tools that we create, which is in co-creation with partners, is to kind of really bake that into the software design so that we're not actually involved in any of the protecting of information because all of the control is in the hands of the community. So indigenous data sovereignty is really one of our core values that uh, we bake into the software. So everything that I shared, including Mapeo and Terra stories, um, all of the data resides um, locally first and foremost. So, and it can be residing offline as well. So you don't have to rely on a cloud server. You know, some communities have hesitance with sharing it um, on platforms like Amazon or Google. And so all of the control is on a local basis. And then each of these tools has mechanisms built into it that permit you to make decisions around sharing. So if you do want to share some stories, you know, and like for example, with the Mari Atlas, there were, there's a selection of stories that are accessible to the public and there's some that are held back. 
um, you can make those decisions in the tools that we're building. Um, so there's complete control over that process. Thank you. And we also, uh, we have a question for Dania from Karen asking, are migratory patterns of fish and marine mammals shared in any way with other coastal and ocean peoples or fisheries planning organization mm -hmm. international? How can this help your people with conservation and ocean refuge needs to help with ocean and fishing recovery? What are ways you share information exchanges and can people update and continue to use this information for government and local and global planning? So it's many questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are many. <laughs> there are many questions. Um, when I referred to the earlier mapping of our ancestors who understood migratory pathways of, of like the whales and fish and so forth, I was talking about them crossing the oceans. And no doubt, you know, there are many of the islands that have their own, you know, fisheries and, and um, ocean and marine life specialists who still do that. How they share it, um, I'm not 100% sure because that's done locally. But um, what I was talking about was how we can um, map those places now using some of those um, um, global platforms like you know, Google Earth and, and Street View and maps and so forth. Um, well, but there was another part of the question, I don't know, the second part of the question. Yes. How can it be guaranteed that indigenous holders of knowledge maintain their agency and control of information? Once so it's, really, it's, a, it's kind of like a data sovereignty question again. Uh, isn't it? And that's that's quite a, quite interesting because it's it's a thread that goes through everything. And like I said, everything is about sovereignty. So it's um, what Takara and Ruto were talking about earlier. It's like what do we keep and what do we share and how do we share it with with each other? And like I, I mentioned earlier, is that we won't do any work without the permission. We won't just go in because there's a technical ability. We, we, we would go in and ask for permission to get stories, to take imagery, to, to get photos or whatever, because it also gives people and communities the opportunity to dress up, tidy up their places, um, especially because we're working with global platforms like you know Google Earth and Street View and so forth. You, 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 know, you can't just go in and just you know, drive a car around and map something without people being prepared. So it's like, and then having the permission to. So um, during the king's birthday, that's when everyone you know looks good and they go, "This is this could potentially be seen by millions of people." So absolutely, that's fine. But when it's not, there, there are times when it you absolutely shouldn't do it. So it's kind of you know discussions with with people and so that they can understand what they can share and how it is, and are they happy with that to go on a global platform. And it's kind of a yes or no. And if it's a no, that's fine. We, we did the um, some of the disaster work and just shared it with the government. They could use that uh, for emergency planning. And it's not an image that the rest of they want to show to the rest of the world, which is again fine. And it kind of goes to my um, passion for virtual reality and virtual reality tourism. So for it's more sustainable to have a whole lot of people looking at you from afar than actually going to that country and flying on planes and burning up, you know, carbon fuel and fossil fuel and basically wrecking the planet. So virtual tourism versus real tourism would be fantastic. Very true. Thank you. You got another question, Tanya, uh, from Laurie and Roy. I thought I heard, she says, I thought I heard a reference to my friend, and I'm trying to pronounce this well, Hoturoa Barclay Care. <laughs> yeah. Um, of, of course, Hotu is very well known as a, um, a master, um, as a captain of our waka in canoe, um, canoe culture in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and across the Pacific. So, yeah, I would encourage everybody to have a look at his, his work and wayfinding and his canoe. Um, one of the canoes, Honori, um, my husband did the carving on as well, and I had the opportunity to put hundreds of the little tiny power eyes across the, that waka. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, in the Q&A box. Uh, would anyone like to follow up or ask one last question? Okay, if not, I would like to thank our three panelists for this amazing work. Um, we all 
it was fascinating and it'll take some time to process, but we got the information of your website. So we're going to follow, I'm going to follow your work and continue reading about your projects. So thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much to the audience. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being here and being part of the conversation. Now we're going to make a pause for lunch um, and we will reconvene at, is it 12.45? I think we're good on time. So uh, yes, we will reconvene at 12.45 and we can all take a lunch break for now. Mm -hmm.